Tell us a little bit about Go Overseas, uh, what your product is, what it does. Sure. Yeah, I'm just a step away from the Reed Hoffman level at this point, but I'm, I'm comfortable with that. <laughs> uh, so Go Overseas. So you know, we're our, our brief pitch of what we are. Uh, we're basically like a Yelp TripAdvisor for programs abroad. So we list every program in the world with ratings and reviews. That's study abroad programs, volunteer abroad programs, internships, gap year programs, adventure travel. Um, and our whole goal is to help people make more informed, educated decisions when they're choosing between programs. There's just a ton out there, as anyone who's searched for any of those programs is probably nodding along with me right now. Um, so our idea is to give better information and help people make better choices and ultimately encourage more people to go and participate in meaningful programs abroad because we think that makes a big difference. And how long have you been working on Go Overseas? From like the idea phase in the shower till now, I'll, I'll go with three years. Okay. But we launched about you know, a little over two years ago, two and a half years ago. Sure. And, and tell me about that, that process. Like, you know, what was the getting started process like for you? <laughs> it's always tough. I mean, we've, we've pivoted and you know, gone in a whole bunch of different directions and experimented in so many different ways. And that's been part of the stress and the joy of, uh, of starting a company. Um, so, you know, I mean, when you first start, I, I really believe in the Eric Ries Lean Startup Model, and we use that all the time, you know, build, learn, iterate. Um, and we've, we've made a lot of changes along the way, and, and that's been, it's been a lot of fun. You know, there have been some ups and downs. There's days where you feel like it's just not going to work, and thankfully, you know, I think we're transitioning from startup into real company mode, and that's, that's a much better place to be. Fantastic. Now, uh, part of why we, we have people like yourself on is, we want to encourage our audience to pursue their dreams and take risks and try new things, but eyes wide open. Like, it is not an easy path. 90% of the startups in the Valley don't make it. Um, and what's, what's the worst day for you? Like, what, what's the worst day, Ben, in, during, during your process? Like, you know, we want people to be aware that this is not easy. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, I'd say the worst day for us came when we, we were hit by a Google al algorithm update out of nowhere. Uh, last year, and we figured it out, and and you know got beyond it. But uh, I didn't. So this, this was the the penguin update. Uh, yeah, questionable whether it was panda or penguin. Google can okay. tell us. I'm, I'm I'm happy to listen which sure. one it was. But uh, we're not we're not exactly sure. Either way, it affected our traffic a lot overnight. And thankfully, we had a great you you know user base and community already anyway, and that that helped us. But you know when your traffic takes a big dip, everyone relies on Google to some sure. degree. Uh, and that was an extremely stressful moment, and we weren't sure we would be able to continue. And so, I think so there was a, there was a, your, your business was going along. You yep. were sort of climbing, yeah, up, good, good progress, yep. and then there was an update that Google did, a technological update that like cut your traffic in what half or a third like, overnight. Yeah, something like that. And and that sort of imperils the future of your business. Absolutely, and and, and you know it affects you in so many different ways. I mean, a clients notice that's a problem. Uh, it affects employee morale when you're at a, at a small company. With ten people, which is which is what we are right now, ten great people, um, if you're listening. So uh, you know that affects employee morale, it affects your morale, and you have to find a way to fight through that and, and keep people working hard and let them know that we're going to get through this and and it's going to be okay. But um, you know, to your original point too, for entrepreneurs out there who are thinking about doing it, I think it always takes longer than you think. It always takes longer than you think. Uh, the few exceptions out there, like the Instagrams, give people the false hope that there's going it's going to be a quick turnaround and you're going to make a lot sure. of money and be a success overnight. And the reality is that. It takes three to five years for almost every successful business to truly make it. Yeah, and let's talk about what what does success mean? Because the 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 glitz and the glamour is are the Instagram stories, the the YouTubes, the Facebooks, the you know Zuckerberg and uh, and that sort of thing. But the reality is that that's not really the case for most businesses. Like, what's how do you think about what success is for your business? Yeah, it's it's a great question. I mean. For me, success is two things. I mean, first of all, you want to have the monetary success. That's, you know, that, that's a big part of it, right? But for me, more important is getting up every day and, and really being passionate about what I'm doing, working with people that I really enjoy, feeling like I'm doing something creative and fun and interesting that makes a difference um, in people's lives. So to me, it's some combination of that formula. And, and I'm a big believer in that. If of, you're of, of money and meaning. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's a more concise way to put it sure. than I did. But, uh, <laughs> I think, I think one, one thing I, I really believe strongly in is that if you're just doing it for the money, it's likely not to work, Yeah. You know, or the odds are more stacked against you. You have to really love it because you're going to be doing it 80, 100 hours a week, and you have to love that. Yeah, and, and the go overseas thing is really makes sense in terms of your life experience and narrative. Like Living abroad was really, really important to you, correct? Yeah. And maybe you yeah. can tell a little bit about how that informed your passion and then your experience with that overseas 
you know, market kind of informed the, the, the product that you eventually came up with. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So for me, it's, it's one of those examples where you, you make one choice in life and you don't have no idea how it's going to have this domino effect on the rest of your life. And, and that happened to me. I, I studied abroad in Taiwan for a year um, and then ended up starting my first company there and lived there for five years. And that company was? Reach to Teach. Okay. Education-based recruitment company. Sure. In Asia. Uh, and, and yeah, and so from, from there, you know, I, I was very involved in kind of the international ed education field, which was really important to me. Um, felt passionately about the, the global exchange and, and globalization, which was obvi obviously affecting everyone, and, and the idea of meaningful travel, you know, not, not just going to, to uh, hang out at a beach for a week, not that there's anything wrong with that, I do that too. Right. But if you're able to really interact with the local community through study abroad and volunteer abroad programs. And, um, and contribute to a local community. Absolutely, right. Yeah. We all we learn from each other. I learn more from the countries I've been to than I think they've learned from me. Um, so, so yeah, that, that's been really important to me. And I think living that and, and immersing myself in that, and then also having an entrepreneurial frame of mind, was a good combination. I think if you if you you know focus on a particular area and you are creative and have good ideas, then it's a good it's a good mix. Hopefully, sure. And tell me about how you have. Um, educated yourself through the process of starting kind of multiple businesses, um, and and what you know how you keep your keep sharpening your skills on a, on a kind of a daily basis. That's such a tough question because to be honest, I probably don't do <laughs> as good a job of that as I should. I mean, when you're just in it every day, sometimes it's really really hard to see the forest for the trees. Uh, but I think you know, I've been reading a little bit lately about the transition from you know being a small three to five person team to then growing to a 10 to 20 person team. And I think there really is successful founders have a mental shift there where you have to uh, find ways to continue to keep the company growing without you being involved in every sale and every little thing that happens in the company every day. And so that, that's something I'm really trying to do. Uh, professional uh, development, you know, reading things a lot, uh, trying to keep myself reading, reading books and the new things that are coming out for online marketing, things like that, which is a constant challenge that I'm, I'm probably failing at, but I, I try on a regular basis. Sure. Well, let's talk about your team. Um, so sure. we're, we're friends uh, at a personal level outside of, of business, and uh, I've that, that was a little presumptuous, but but okay. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> but I've you know you've over and over again talked about your team and how important they they are to you. Yeah. Um, how do you go about recruiting great people as a startup owner? Um, how do you go about retaining great people? Um, talk about that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's by far the most important thing. And um, my co-founders, Andrew and, uh, and Tucker, have been, the company would not exist without them in the way that it does. And, and our, our, you know, our key employees, Nadia and Megan, and people like that have just been uh, amazing in our growth. It, it's, it's hard to find good people. And we've had fits that, that didn't happen either. To me, the lessons that I've learned are that you have to find someone who really believes in what you're doing. And then on my end, as a founder, you should be so generous that it hurts. And by that, I mean with, with equity. Um, and they really have to feel, I think, that you genuinely care because it, right. it's not a nine to five job. And if they treat it like a nine to five job, that's not a good thing for the company. So you have to reflexively also show them that you care more than someone in a nine to five job would care about their employees. Sure. And so that's uh, both on an equity basis, meaning they have shares and options in the, in the company. Um, yep. What about what about in terms of like workload and ownership? Like you, you talked about how removing yourself from the day to day decision making is difficult. How do you think about that as a uh, for for your relationships with the individual employees? Yeah, I, I mean the short answer is that I give people as much responsibility as they're willing to take. Sure, and and I recognize that for them that that can be stressful too because they're given a lot more responsibility than they would have in, in another company, uh, and so I think. My job is to support them in every way that I can and right. lock and tackle some of the little stuff so they can focus on what's really important in their job. And then also I think that they need to know and, and really believe, and this is true in my case definitely, that I really care about their professional development. And hopefully that, that's at our company for like, overseas for a very long time. But even if they leave, that they know that they're going to have an ally and a supporter to me forever. Right. Well, and that's uh, sort of dovetails on a theme that, that Reed and Ben were talking about, which is this: um, there, there are a variety of different ways to train yourself and to find opportunity. And sort of one of the trade-offs that you make going to a startup, uh, wh which I've done a couple times in my career now, is you may not have the same uh, pay rate that you would get going to a large established company, but the opportunity to learn and grow and do things that you otherwise wouldn't have the opportunity to in the long term can outweigh the, the short-term financial gains. 
Um, I don't know if that is actually phrased in the form of a question, but like, how do you think about that? And like, what, what do you think about that? No, I, I completely agree. I mean, it might be taking a little bit of a step back salary wise mm -hmm. in the beginning at a startup, but it means that you'll move forward at a much more rapid pace in your career. I think that that's exactly what you meant. And I, I, I completely agree. Yeah, and so for a personal story, like I did that, uh, I was in New York working in advertising, uh, producing TV commercials, and I saw that the internet was rising uh, rapidly and that the TV world was kind of stagnating and, and flattening. And so I took a, a pay cut to go work at a uh, online production startup building websites for brands and stuff. And I was, I basically flamed out in a matter of months. It was, um, you know, not the right fit for me personally. And though I wasn't fired, it was pretty close. Uh, but during that, during that four months, you know, so I, I roll out of this and I'm like, oh, I took a pay cut. I failed. It was awful. During those four months, I gained an incredible amount of skills that allowed me to actually get to the West Coast for my next job, which happened to be Google, and then that has been a, a radical turnaround for me. So I got very, very lucky, but if you don't, you know, I looked for a growth opportunity, a learning opportunity, and I, I paid for it um, by, you know, taking a lower salary instead of, you know, going to school. And yeah. the end of that story is that you're sitting here now, right, running, yeah, running I, a, I great, and a great and company, and a great I'm, startup. And, you know, and yeah. I'm, I'm the luckiest guy I know uh, that this literally Creative Live is my, my dream job. I get to sit here and learn uh, from great people and, and talk to great people like yourself and, and constantly you know, grow my skills every day and help other people uh, grow their skills. Um, do we have any questions from folks in the room for, for Mitch, who is in it every day? Yes. There's a little microphone action there. Um, so I have a startup, but how do you think about um, equity in your first employees? Great question. So I'll, I'll keep it general here, but I'm more than happy to talk offline too about, about specifics. But you know, my philosophy is be so generous that it hurts. So if, I, if, I, if I'm putting together an equity package for someone, my initial instinct, then I, I'll push myself a little further. Because I think you know, startups, it's all a dream, right? It's all an, an idea. It's not really worth anything. We really get into cap tables and all this kind of stuff. But it's only if it really works. And so for me, I want my employees to have the exact same incentives and motivations that I do, which is to create a big, successful company, um, both on a personal level and, and monetary level, right? And so I want those incentives to be aligned. And to me, that means uh, giving them a generous equity pay. Uh, and, and even if that means me taking a little bit of a hit, but creating a bigger pie, that I think that's OK. But it surprises me, actually, how many people don't, don't do that. Um, sorry. Yeah, Just follow up question. Follow up. Um, a little closer your, to that. How, how do your investors take that? Uh, so we're, we're actually, and this is a topic we, could, we can dive into a little bit more. So we're, we're more bootstrapped. Uh, you, you know, I was lucky to have had a first company before this, so. So I, I was able to invest myself and, and a little bit of friends and family. Um, so, so it's both a positive and a negative that we don't have to, to answer to investors. Um, yeah. And, and actually, so if uh, I'm going to put you on the, feel free not to answer this question. But as, so the, the advice for, for folks maybe breaking into a startup as an employee as opposed to a founder, right. um, how should they think about negotiating for an equity package. I think this is an incredibly valuable uh, piece of knowledge that a lot of people don't have as they're, yeah. as they're entering the startup world. Like, how do you negotiate for an equity package versus the, the rest of it? Well, I think, first of all, it's, it, every employee is different, right? So it, if, if an employee has a, a family and, and, and kids, then obviously salary, immediate salary may be more important. Right. But in the situation you're presenting where someone wants more equity, I think every founder that hears from an employee, I'd prefer to go heavier on the equity and lighter on the salary, that should be a great thing that every founder wants to hear because it means that they believe in the idea and they want to invest for the yep. right reasons, their, their personal time. So I, I think uh, if an employee wants to negotiate on that point and says that to a founder, that's a great starting point. And as long as they're being fair and reasonable right. uh, with their request, and, and it's easy to find that stuff out from what the general market is doing, then it, hopefully the founder does the same thing and is fair with that employee. Yeah, and, and so what you're saying is there's a, a trade-off between potentially uh, trading off equity for a larger equity component, uh, a lower salary component to make sure that um, the, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a reasonable total package in incentives and that if you you know, go heavier on the equity, essentially you're playing a longer game you have uh, a lot of belief that the company is going to have a positive outcome down the road. A little bit, maybe a little bit more risk potentially. Um, but 
you know, so what's your what's your thought about salary negotiation for someone starting off? Like, yeah, I think I, I, first of all, I agree with with everything you just said. That I think that that's spot on. Um, I, I talk to a lot of founders, and, and sometimes I know that that the equity conversation, both with between co-founders and also between employees, can be contentious because yeah, I mean for obvious reasons, right? Yes, and that's what you're there till midnight for every yeah. night is to and, build and the that's, company. Frankly, that's one of the reasons why I you know I flamed out of my uh, early startup was like we weren't able to have that conversation in a productive way, and a lot of that was on me for not knowing how to have it. Well, it, it, it's amazing to me I have, having gone through it a few times. It, I felt that way during my first startup too, but you realize quickly that. It's not worth anything anyway right now. Right. So let's quickly get past the all these hypotheticals of how much money you're going to make in five years and talk about just just get it done, make it fair, and move on to actually building right. something special. Yeah. So I, I think that's really the way to go, although I recognize that can be painful. If you can keep that in mind that that really does make sense and it's the right thing for everyone, that can guide the conversation. Terrific. If you had any other piece of advice for either early stage uh, company employees or founders, what would it be? Big thing that I've been talking about a lot lately is be realistic with yourself about what your company can be worth, right? So I think that especially in the Bay Area, uh, funding sometimes is the goal rather than the method to get to that goal. Sure. Um, it becomes the goal in and of itself. And I think that a lot of great companies are failing because they're raising too much money, right? Because if you raise too much money, then you have to go hit the home run. There's, not, there's no other option for you. Sure. You need to hit a home run. Uh, whereas if you take less funding or no funding and, and bootstrap it along the way, then uh, you can have a single or double, and that feels like a home run for an entrepreneur, for almost every entrepreneur, yeah. right? So I think I think it's really important to be honest with yourself about how big your market is. It's, it's easy to create a spreadsheet for an investor that shows you be creating a billion dollar company or multiple hundred million dollar company, but the reality is that those type of companies are so few and far between. Yeah, they're, uh, they're essentially a, a handful of exits per year above the handful. hundred million dollars, Hand, like handful. tiny. But to me, there's this interesting gap in the market right now between you know, a one in $20 million company where people were more realistic about that that's really where they could be, that that's really where they could fit, we'd see a lot more successes rather than people raising a lot of money quickly and then spending it quickly and, and, and um, failing. And, and the thing is too, once you raise money, you're gonna spend it, right? Yeah. I mean, you have that money in the bank account, you're gonna hire quickly, and once you have that monthly run rate, uh, you run through it really quickly, and if you can't maintain it, you, you can't meet the metrics, then, then the company's really done. It's really hard to recover from running out of money. Sure. Um, the website is gooverseas.com. Gooverseas.com. Uh, we'd love to hear from anybody out there who's, who's watching it. Join our community. Feel free to reach out to us about any questions you have. Terrific. Yeah. Uh, one of the things you talked about earlier was uh, maybe that you haven't done quite enough studying of uh, current trends in marketing. Um, I'm going to say thank you for participating here, and then I'm going to bring an online marketing expert to the stage, and maybe if you want to hang out in the audience, you. you benefit from the Creative Lab community as well. Sounds great. What, cool. what a great segue, Rich. Uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Mitch Gordon, everybody. Big, big round of applause. Thank you, guys. Thank you, sir. Really appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks. Yeah.